Well, good morning, everybody. Pastor Scott here. It is May 29th, uh, Saturday morning when I'm recording this. Uh, it's a cold, gray, rainy morning outside. And actually, I'm a little bit happy about it because, uh, because of all the pollen that we've had. And I've been praying for rain, and finally it came. So uh, that being said, um, nevertheless, there's, uh, there's still some pollen in some spots in which I go uh, that are inside. So, and that includes my office. I already tried to record this video one time, but a few minutes in, I started uh, having a runny nose, and so I had to kind of stop the video. And here we're going to just start over, and hopefully it won't happen again. I think I hopefully mitigated the problem. But in any event, we are uh, we are moving on in our study through uh, Graham Goldsworthy's According to Plan, uh, his sort of popular level uh, written uh, biblical theology of uh, study of the whole Bible. And um, we are moving into chapter 10, which deals with uh, the fall, deals with the fall. Now, this is the third chapter in the section of the book that's dealing with kind of the scriptural storyline. Uh, the first whole section of the book, the first uh, seven chapters, were really dealing with uh, kind of methodology and theory about how to approach the Bible, why we need hermeneutics, what's wrong with our thinking as uh, fallen people and why we need the Lord to renew it and what things that we should probably bring to us as we study the scripture. And once that was established, and I felt like it was established really well, uh, we then moved into this next section that deals with kind of the whole storyline of the Bible. And it's going to go all the way, I think, up until like a 26th chapter, something like that. But the first chapter in this section, chapter 8, was talking about how Jesus is the first and the last. Um, and so, whereas it follows the storyline of the Bible, that set, the whole section does, um, it starts with Jesus because the New Testament calls him uh, the first and the last, which means even though you don't see him explicitly on the first page of Genesis, perhaps, um, him calling himself the first and the last and, uh, and Scripture referring to him as such says that we are therefore supposed to start with him when we do our uh, study of the Scripture. So, uh, for instance, the writer of Hebrews uh, tells us that in these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son, through whom he created the world. Well, he created the world by speaking words, and so since Christ is called the Word of God, that's saying that he is himself the first word, but in these last days he's spoken to us by his Son. That means he's the last word, too. So Jesus is the first word of God, and he's the last word of God. That's not to say that he's you know, created or, or anything like that but that he is indeed the, the word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Father, and he's the first, the firstborn of all creation, meaning that he's more important than anything else, and indeed the agent of creation. So the point is just that he's the first and the last, and that is supposed to mean that we start with him in our, in our approach to understanding kind of how the whole Bible makes sense together. The next chapter dealt with creation by the word, and that really got us into Genesis, Jesus' uh, role in that as the word of God. And so uh, that got us into Genesis, and now we're moving on through Genesis into dealing with the fall. Now, the fall of humanity, this represents really the great problem uh, which the Scripture is preoccupied with remedying. Um, really, everything about uh, the fall and, and all the effects of it, that's the problem that the Scripture presents. And really, that's the thing that the Bible is, uh, is focused on remedying as the story uh, the storyline uh, continues on. It's all about, uh, you know, redeeming the creation from the fall. Um, the notion of the fall, it means that contrary to kind of Gnostic, ancient kind of Gnostic views of the material world, and even some, I would say, probably more perverted versions of Platonistic views of the material world would be that the material world is bad and the spiritual realm is good, and so we have to kind of get out of the material realm into a spiritual realm and, um, and, you know, Gnostic forms of Christianity said that's what Jesus came to do. Well, that's not, that's not really the case. Uh, biblically, the creation, the material world, was originally good. Originally, it was actually very good. Uh, but it's fallen because of the place of humanity in God's economy. Uh, humanity sins and the rest of the creation falls uh, along with humanity because of how important he is. So the creation is not bad, creation is simply fallen. Those are two different things. And if it's fallen, that means that it can be redeemed. And so you just see how different that is than, um, than some kind of forms of, of um, uh, you know, kind of couching the problem and, and, and uh, stating the problem. Um, so we wanna move into a Genesis three here and look at the fall itself. 
And uh, what we find here is that it starts with temptation. It starts with temptation. You've got this serpent in verse 1 who is more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. So the serpent is a created being. He's a created being. And he says to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Now, I just want to be very clear here. The serpent is identified in the book of Revelation with the devil. Very clear that the serpent is identified with the devil. And you hear like kind of some newer versions of uh, studies of Genesis where people suggest that the serpent is something other than the devil. I don't think that they're really uh, doing justice to kind of how the, how the Bible, how the scripture just generally treats uh, that they're not really keeping the whole picture in mind. Uh, Revelation is very clear that the serpent is the devil. He's a created being probably in whom the devil entered, just like the devil entered into Judas at a particular time, at a particular moment in history. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, this is identified with the devil. There's not really much about the devil's origin as the devil in the Bible. We, uh, we know that he's a fallen angel. We're not quite sure exactly what that means. Some people cite sh certain chapters in some of the prophetic literature, in particular Isaiah, I think chapter 14. Uh, I tend to think that they're not really conclusive about the devil. I think they're talking about more historical things there. Um, so there's not really much about him, but we know that he is an enemy of the people of God. We know that he accuses them to God and that he accuses God to us. And so he's this adversary, this accuser, all of that. And uh, he's a problem. And we see how he's a problem right here uh, in, uh, in particular in Genesis 3. This is a very unusual story that happens here. The serpent speaks. As far as I know, I think there are only two instances when an animal speaks uh, in the Bible. It's him and uh, Balaam. Uh, but the only way that Romans 5 can make sense, and the only way that therefore Jesus truly redeems us from the fall, is if this is telling history. This is more than poetry, but this is actually telling a historical thing. Because Romans 5 says that Adam, you know, in Adam all are condemned, but in Jesus all can be redeemed. Uh, that only makes sense. It only makes sense that Jesus, who came in history to redeem us, it only makes sense if Adam lived in history uh, as well. So I just want to say that I think that that's an important thing to keep in mind. But the narrative here is this. First, we know there are kind of seven points throughout the narrative, and we're still under kind of the heading of temptation here. The first point of the seven narrative points is under the temptation heading. This is where the serpent casts doubt on the devil's word. Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Now you're going to notice here that that's not exactly what God said back in chapter 2. Uh, he just said to not eat from any from the tr this particular tree. But here this is what the devil does. He's crafty, as it says there in verse 1. Um, he, he kind of enter, um, introduces confusion uh, into the situation. And uh, the idea here, the idea that's being put out there uh, in this, that the devil is trying to um, accuse God in the woman's eyes by making her think that God's word cannot be trusted as the absolute authority and source of truth. So after the woman responds, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it. You probably know that God never said the part about never touching it, lest you die. The serpent says to the woman, verses 4 and 5, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. So he is getting the woman to think that God's word can't be trusted as the absolute authority and source of truth. Um, it's very important for our study here uh, to, to see that this is the devil's work, is to just constantly introduce um, distrust toward the word of God in our perspective. Well, uh, we move, therefore, into the heading of the fall, into the second part of the narrative, and that is that in all of this, God's word is therefore treated as words just like any other words, um, just like human words, you know? So don't trust his words. They're just words, basically. Um, he's not telling you the truth, and that's way different than how God's word is treated in Genesis 1, isn't it? Two chapters earlier, he speaks and things are created, so therefore it should be looked at as the authoritative word of God. Um, but instead, this is the serpent's work, is to try to um, get the woman to think that God's word is just words. You know, just words like any other, like any other words. So the woman, she, uh, she goes through this kind of process of thinking about this. In verse 6, the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes. So she sees, well, it's just food. You know, it's just, it's just fruit. Uh, it's a delight to the eyes. It's, it looks good. 
um, and that the tree was desired to be make to make one wise. You know what? Maybe the devil's telling the truth. She says she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some, gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate uh, as well. So Adam is uh, right there. She decides that God can't be trusted. She decides that God can't be trusted, and so realizing fourthly here that something is lost that something is uh, lost if they don't eat the fruit from the tree. They, um, or rather, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So, so she listens to the enemy. Um, she begins to believe that God's word can't be trusted, eats the fruit from the tree, and then gives some to Adam as well, who's right there the entire time. And then something happens to them. Something happens to them. The eyes of both of them, verse 7, are opened, and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. So what happens here is this. Um, it, you know, let me say this first, real, real quick. Verse 8 as well. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So what's happening is this. They no longer trust God's word. And so they listen to the enemy. They do what God said not to do. And now they realize that something is lost. They're ashamed of themselves. So they try and save themselves, sewing together loincloths, hiding behind the bushes, etc., etc. They're they're trying to save themselves, um, and uh, so as Goldsworthy says in his book here, dissatisfied with their humanness, the couple reached for godhood. That's basically what the serpent said. He knows that you'll be like God if you eat the fruit from the tree, and so they say, you know what? That's what we want. that's what we want. But then, but then it doesn't it doesn't actually work. It doesn't actually happen. Uh, they lose something. They they receive this knowledge of good and evil, which I take to mean that they receive this kind of knowledge that that of confusion. Like now they're confused. Now who knows what's truly good and what's truly evil? Um, they're, now they're confused, and the enemy has uh, has won right here. Well, the third heading here brings us into the fifth point of the narrative. So the first heading was temptation. The point under that was doubt by the devil's word. The second heading was the fall itself. And the, the, three, head, the uh, three points under that in the narrative, God's word treated as just any word. The woman decides that God cannot be trusted. And fourthly, they realize something is lost. So they try to save themselves with the loincloths and hiding in the bushes. The third heading here is, uh, is judgment. And this is where we see the fifth point. The judgment from their perspective is that they blame God. So he comes and he looks for them. They blame God. And uh, in verse 12, the man said, The woman you gave me, uh, you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. So uh, Adam is saying, it's, it's, it's your fault, God. It's the woman you gave me uh, that, uh, that did this. And then Eve, in verse 13, she blames God as well. Uh, look what she says. When the Lord says to the woman, what is this that you've done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So it was the serpent that you created. It's part of your creation. I mean, this is what they're doing. They're both blaming God instead of taking responsibility for what they've done. So, so the sixth point here in the narrative is that God then judges them. God then judges them. Um, after uh, cursing the serpent and then giving a promise that we'll talk about here in just a couple of minutes... Um, he uh, tells the woman that because of what's happened here, there's going to be pain. I'll multiply your pain in childbearing, and pain you'll bring forth children. So uh, childbearing will be, will be painful. Raising them will be painful. And then he says to the man, or rather he says to her further, your desire will be for your husband and he'll rule over you. So you'll be constantly dissatisfied with uh, your state in life. You'll constantly want to have more power than you actually do, but it's, it's, it's not going to happen. Um, and then he tells the man in verses 17 to 19 that life is going to be just full of hard work, toil, and pain from this point forward. And that's what he says. There, life is going to be full of hard work, toil, and pain from this point forward. Um, Cursed is the ground, and pain you'll eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it'll bear for you. Uh, by the sweat of your face you'll eat bread till you return to the ground, uh, until you die. For you are dust, and to dust you shall uh, return. So pain and hard work, that's the judgment that God is giving. So again, the creation is not bad, it's just fallen. It's fallen because of how important humanity is to God. Humanity sins, and now the rest of creation falls as well. But I want you to know that in verse 15, before he says all this, when he, he uh, gives this promise, when he says, I will put enmity between you, the serpent, 
and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Now a woman doesn't a woman doesn't have seed. A man has seed. You know, man that's what happens in in uh, in procreation. You know, the man lays his seed. Sorry, I know this is uh, this sounds strange, but that's what happens. He's the one who brings the seed to the woman. So the fact that he is using this phraseology here to the woman talking about her seed means that it seems like he's talking about something other than just than just the humanity that's going to come from her. seems like actually he's talking about a person in particular. Um, that's how the New Testament treats it. So there'll be enmity between the serpent seed and the woman's seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So you'll give him a foot injury, but he'll give you a head injury. And that, you know, that seems to imply that that eventually he is going to destroy you. Although you might get a, a minor victory over him, like you've gotten a victory here, serpent, he is going to eventually destroy you. So hard work, pain is coming, but there's a promise of a redemptive plan. And uh, that is going to come eventually. This is called the Proto-Evangelion, the, uh, the gospel as it was preached way before uh, the gospel was uh, explicit, you know, once you get to the New Testament. But I just want you also to notice uh, further that this establishes, humanity's fall here establishes early on that man is prone to folly. This is how we are. We're not as smart as we think we are. Like the old Rich Mullen song said, we're not as strong as we think we are. Ecclesiastes 7.29, God made man upright, but now he's gone after many schemes. So we are scheme-driven. We go, we go after folly. Furthermore, it also establishes, excuse me, that God is a righteous judge. So Psalm 711, God is a righteous judge, a God who feels indignation every day. Um, so he judges them. And that's why Abraham testifies later on in Genesis 18 that God is the judge of the whole earth and he will judge rightly. So humanity is prone to folly uh, and God is a, is a righteous judge. God is the creator, provider, and the judge. And it seems like later on in the chapter, in verse 20, the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. In verse 21, the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Clothed them. God is also the Redeemer. He's the one who clothes them. He's the one who offers the sacrifice and, uh, and uh, atones for their sins. And so under the judgment heading here, they blame God, but they're wrong. God judges them and he's right. Number seven here, the last the last number in the narrative under the uh, under the um, the narrative, the last heading, the last number under the judgment heading, I should say, is a loss of paradise. So verses twenty two to twenty four, um, man's become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Um, seems to be a, an inner trinitarian conversation. Now lest he reach out his hand, take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. That is to say, he's fallen now, and if he eats from the tree of life, then he's going to perpetuate death forever. So actually what follows is a grace from God. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove the man out, and he can't get back in. And uh, so a loss of paradise. I would suggest that this is the death that is promised back in chapter 2. Whereas in verse 17, he said, if you eat of the tree of evil, not, uh, the knowledge of good and evil, I should say, that you, from which you shall not eat, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. I think that that's, um, that that's talking about how you will be cast out of my perfect presence in Eden. And uh, that's what happens. That's the death that they experience. At least in some, in some sense, it is the death. Of course, they will eventually physically die, yes. But in the New Testament, Jesus... Um, and uh, Paul, and then even the prophets in the Old Testament, they talk about our present state as a state of death. Um, so, you know, even though we might be alive, we're the walking dead, like Paul says in Ephesians 2. Uh, we, are, uh, we are walking after the course of this world, and yet we're dead in our sins. Uh, we're out of God's presence perfectly. Um, and that really should tell us how glorious life with God is supposed to be, actually. Uh, life with God is supposed to be so glorious that, it, that it's eternal life. Um, and uh, so when we come to know Christ who brings us back to God, uh, it is indeed eternal life. Well, let me just say quickly here, um, and I don't want to dig too much into this, but, uh, but over the next several chapters, we're, we launch immediately into several more widespread effects of the fall. Um, one is the effect of human conflict. So there's Cain and Abel. Uh, Cain murders Abel. 
Um, and the point seems to be that the loss of fellowship with God leads to murder, meaning that all human conflict reflects our conflict with God. So immediately, I mean, immediately after humanity falls from God, Adam's blaming Eve, Cain's murdering Abel, human conflict stems from our conflict with God. Um, secondly, secondly, well, furthermore, this is why the New Testament talks so much about the reconciliation that, exper- that is experienced between people um, when they come to know God in Christ. In particular, Ephesians 2 talks about that as well, because he brings peace not only between us and God, but between each other as well. There's a continuing judgment that happens. Cain is judged after he murders Abel, uh, similar to Adam being judged. Cain is going to have a hard lot from that point forward in chapter 4, verses 11 to 12 as well. Um, after that, he goes and he establishes cities, uh, as do his, uh, his uh, lineage after that. And cities are referred to, cities are, are really pretty clearly here places of rebellion, um, not by nature. Cities are not evil by nature, but again, because of human nature, um, cities being places where more humans live, uh, they are really seen as places of rebellion and places of uh, human fallenness. Uh, but nevertheless, you do see art, music, violence, engineering, all of that comes up in that paragraph between verses 17 and 22 of chapter uh, 4. But there are places of murder as well, verses 23 and 24. And then just a continued descent uh, from that point on, um, a continued descent after there's um, after they have a new son, Adam and Eve do, Cain is sent off, Abel is dead. Um, they have a new son, Seth, um, and, uh, and this seems to be kind of looking forward. So there's a holy line that is, that is continuing on. And then chapter 5, there's a, uh, there's a list of descendants all the way to Noah at the point where we find in chapter 6, um, there's, again, just a continued descent. Everything gets more and more evil. Everything gets more and more fallen to the point where in chapter 6, verse 5, every intention of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually, and the Lord regretted that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So just a continued descent, continued fall, and the flood, therefore, um, is an expression of God's righteousness. Uh, it's a judgment on, on God's part because he's a righteous judge. That's something that came up earlier in, in uh, the study here in chapter 3. He's a righteous judge. In chapter 6, he's a righteous judge as well. Um, and so this is, this is just crucially important for us uh, to see that, that God is a righteous judge, a, a God who, when he judges, he, he judges rightly. There's nothing wrong with his approach. Um, but nevertheless, the existence of Noah... As a righteous man, verse 9, Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation, but that comes right after saying that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, It shows us that God has a remnant and his plan to redeem is still in place. Regardless of how far humanity has fallen, Noah shows us that God still has a plan. And what he had said to the serpent is going to eventually be brought about that while he might be making life hard for humanity and he'll make life hard for the Son of God, Jesus, eventually by the fact that he goes to the cross and he dies, nevertheless he's going to rise and he's going to destroy the works of the devil, like 1 John 3, 8 says. So there is a plan and God has it in place and he's going to accomplish it. That's what the existence of Noah as this faithful remnant uh, in the midst of evil is meant to uh, communicate. So let me pray and then I'm going to let you go. So, Father, thank you for uh, your truth, your word, and how it makes sense of our thinking and of our our lives. Help us to follow you. And uh, thank you for your promised plan. Thank you for your your execution of it and for the fact that we are in you, uh, Lord Jesus, um, as as we are united with you and as you've paid for our sins and reconciled us to the Father. And to help us to walk by your Spirit, we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Lord bless you. Talk to you soon.